Good morning, everyone. It's nice to be here. Glad you're with us. Uh, this morning, we are going to do something a little bit different. Uh, we're going to look at a little, uh, some of a, a maybe a, a history lesson. Um, and we're going to talk about some things. And um, one of the things I talked about uh, when I gave my test, my short testimony was nonviolence. Uh, and so I wanted to do um, a couple things, which I'm just calling studies in nonviolence. Um, but today's title um, is called Pay Your Taxes. Pretty interesting, hopefully, to you. It is to me. Um, and what we're going to eventually get to, not today, what we're eventually going to get to is what Jesus had to say about paying taxes, um, because he did have some things to say. And the, what we're going to get from this is nothing about paying or not paying taxes. Uh, we're going to get Jesus' attitude towards um, worldly powers. And I think that's uh, really where the studies of nonviolence go to, is what was the attitude that Jesus had, uh, and what was the attitude he had um, concerning his kingdom and the kingdom of his father towards uh, worldly powers, being not just political, but also religious. Um, any type of power outside of his kingdom. Um, and so today, uh, before we could get, get to anything about taxes, there was some other things I think that uh, might be said before that um, that have to do with uh, Jesus' attitude towards what was going on around him in Palestine, in Rome, because a lot of things were going on. Uh, more than uh, we actually get from our scriptures, uh, a lot of stuff. Uh, many times, I think if we if we read uh, we read the New Testament and the Gospels and what was happening um, around, it's narrowed down to a specific or some specific guidelines of where the, the narration was leading us um, in the story of redemption, um, and it. Uh, I don't want to say it ignored, but it took the things out that weren't necessary for us to get to the story of redemption and what God was doing for mankind. Um, but some of those things that were going on, there are hints of them, and that's what we're going to see today. And the hints of them give us a picture, um, it, give, it gives me, uh, now that I know what they are, a desire to know more about what was going on and and why uh, some of the things are in there and some of the things aren't. Um, so we'll have a word of prayer and then we'll get started. Lord, we're thankful that we are here today. Uh, we're thankful for the, um, the Bible that we have, um, the record that you have given us, uh, and that I believe you've worked to preserve for us uh, for all these years. Uh, and I know you will continue to make sure it's preserved for generations to come. Uh, and we are thankful for that. Uh, thankful for the many uh, helps that go along with it and for the many men that have, and women, uh, who have come before us and will come after us and are here now, who have shown us great things about your word and the work that you are doing. Uh, and we're thankful for that. And we ask that today, uh, through these uh, messages this morning, uh, right now, and, and at 11, uh, that you would bless our hearts uh, with the things that you have for us, uh, and that you would touch our hearts through the week and keep us close to you, uh, as you're always close to us, uh, and, and keep us in your word, your son, uh, as we live our, our lives every day. Amen. All right, so, pay your taxes. Uh, I to be, uh, first of all, you might be wondering if I'm aiming this at a particular group of people. Uh, and I say partly, but also partly at uh, the rest of the world or the rest of the country who thinks you should pay your taxes. There are some people who think you shouldn't. Um, I used to, uh, though I never delved into not doing it, I used to believe that I had strong reservations about should we be paying taxes or not? Is it 
legal? Do they have the right to take my money? Um, and, you know, thankfully, uh, I'll say thankfully, I never took the leap. My wife, of course, would keep me from doing it anyways. But thankfully, I wasn't ever in the position to take that leap because I hear um, through the news and other things of people who don't pay their taxes and the troubles they get into. And then, of course, you have lawyers that help you out with the IRS and all those things. Uh, and that's nothing I would definitely not want to get into. But it's a, uh, for me, it was, a, it was a, maybe a desired form of protest, right? I don't like what the government's doing. I don't like... Uh, the direction that we're headed, all these different things uh, come into it, and you're looking for some way the protester to say, I want to show what I don't like. And so part of that is paying taxes. Uh, I think paying taxes is a big sticking point no matter what political party you belong to. People don't like to pay a lot of taxes, understandably. You know, you work. You earn money so that you can live, and it, you know, it stinks. Look at your paycheck and say, wow, all that went away. Um, but, you know, the question comes to me now, what if Jesus was here right now, and I asked him, just as he was asked, should I pay my taxes? What would he tell me? And so I brought a dollar bill with me because it's the only cash I have. Uh, in this modern day, uh, I use my cell phone for everything, to pay my bills, to do my banking, even to pay in the grocery line for my groceries. Pretty interesting, right? But once in a while, for some reason, I end up with some cash in my pocket. And this was a dollar bill I had left over. And so I just looked at it uh, a few weeks ago as I was rereading a book I read. And I thought, well, Jesus asked them, picture is on the coin. And so I looked at my dollar bill, and George Washington is on the, on the picture. George Washington has long since been dead, so it's definitely not his, but he represents something. United States of America. In the coin that they, which we'll talk about uh, in the next message, the coin that Jesus had or was given had one picture of Caesar. This bill is just littered with things saying, this belongs to the United States of America, right? I mean, it's a legal tender, so I have it in my possession, but it doesn't mean anything until I go to spend it. And the only reason it's worth anything is because of the United States of America. Regardless of the economic policies or how much gold they have in Fort Knox or anything like that, they are saying they will back this dollar. Um, and that matters to the banks. And so I think uh, that has a very large bearing of what we're gonna talk to and about. And hopefully by the time we're done, we'll see that uh, many would say, oh yeah, but that was in Palestine way back then, and it doesn't matter today. Um, I think it does matter today. Uh, and I think it matters for the very reasons that Jesus was trying to get across uh, to the folks that were asking him about paying taxes, which uh, in the end has nothing to do with money or actually having to pay taxes. Uh, it has to do with something entirely different, uh, which is really cool. Um, so the, the taxing has something to do with zealots. Uh, and the zealots, uh, zealotism was very popular in Jesus' day. Uh, and there's a, a small amount that is talked about uh, in the Gospels about zealots, just a small amount. However, in Palestine, zealotism was very widespread among the Jewish population. And so, how do we find out about that? Well, let's talk a minute about Palestine of Jesus' day. Um, beginning with the time that uh, they were allowed to go back and build the temple and build Jerusalem again, um, 
there were large portions uh, of Israel, or we'll say Jewish folks, who stayed out in uh, the countries they came from. Uh, and some returned, but out of, uh, as they grew again as a city, never as a nation, they uh, was born out of that were the three groups, Pharisees, Sadducees, and Essenes. And these three groups uh, had all different ideas about what Israel should be, what the Jewish people they should be aligned with, um, and what they should be uh, doing as far as worship. Um, attached to these, these men, uh, and unattached, uh, were groups of people who made it their life's work to free uh, Jerusalem from whoever was around controlling it so that they could expand again into a nation. So the time between the Testaments um, is where these folks came out of. Uh, we don't have a record of unless you have an Apocrypha. Um, if you don't have an Apocrypha and you're opposed to getting Apocrypha, don't get a Bible with an Apocrypha in it if it bothers you. Just get the Apocrypha because you can buy that as a book. Um, I happen to have it in many of my Bibles. And there are some books called uh, the Maccabees. And if you read those, you'll get some, some of this information out of there, though it's skewed again to a Jewish writer's uh, thinking. You can also read Josephus, uh, and he will give you um, actually a, a history through the Old Testament and then carrying on from that period uh, right up uh, unto the time that the Jewish wars happened and Jerusalem was destroyed. But it was anything but a peaceful period uh, in between the Testaments. They were a constant battle or war with somebody or amongst each other. Uh, as uh, the country of Greece through Alexander took over the world. Um, it really started uh, to become more intense because now they had an empire that they were going to try to fight. And that's what you read about uh, in the Maccabees. And um, they had some success uh, against the Greeks and were able to gain um, some amount of uh, freedom from them. But again, even you even read in there, if you read the Maccabees, among each other, they had issues uh, which prevented um, them from going further. Uh, I almost think of uh, uh, Braveheart. It's one of my favorite movies, right? The Scottish. And, uh, you know, they were warring constantly against the English, or they wanted to be free, but they could never get themselves together to become a unified force and fight the English out of their nation. So what happened? They always had been part of uh, under English rule, um, as they are today. In fact, it wasn't uh, several years ago they had a big vote over there, should we separate from the, from the UK? And of course, it was turned down. So they still are there now, even though many people are still upset about that. Uh, that's kind of, in my mind, what I, I picture um, these folks as being. Um, so there were many battles, many uh, wars going on. In Jesus' time, um, zealotism was very popular. There were many uh, groups of people or men um, who were trying to whip up people to get at the Romans. Um, and that is what, that's where we see their whole idea of a Messiah is. Even when Jesus was alive, we hear there was other Messiahs before and after, even while he was in his ministry, there were other people claiming to be Messiah. Um, and so the reason being is because they wanted a Messiah who was going to come and establish the kingdom of Israel again uh, after knocking out Rome. That's what they were looking for. Uh, and so there were always things going on. Uh, Rome had their hands full with Israel. Uh, or with the Jews. And uh, of course, we know how that eventually turned out because they decided that, all right, we're tired of having our hands full all the time. We're just going to take care of this once and for all. Um, 
unfortunately for them, even after they took care of it, their hands were still full uh, because these folks kept going at it. Um, but in Romans 5, 6, uh, we won't turn there, but we'll open our Bibles pretty soon. Uh, it says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. And sometimes I wonder, what, what did he mean by the right time? What, you know, was it just God decided it's the right time? Why did God decide it's the right time? Well, uh, obviously this is a, a uh, statement about uh, redemption and salvation or soteriology. And, but is there other, other, other reasons that God chose to send Jesus in the flesh on the earth and sometimes I wonder and this is just me wondering did the conditions in Palestine and among the Jewish population in Rome have to do with why he came to earth uh, why he decided now is the time I need to step in right now because uh, these people are getting out of hand um, I have my son there. He is the Messiah. I need to show them this is what it's about and that they've really overstepped their bounds and the time has come. Um, so, you know, I, I thought, is it, you know, the word I thought of, to, of my, to myself last night was shenanigans, right? That's what we say when things are, people are doing things all the time. Was God looking and saying, all right, that's enough of your shenanigans. I'm putting a stop to this right now. Um, I don't know. Uh, could it have been that there was the knowledge that yes, some people aren't gonna leave Jerusalem and a lot of people are gonna die because of it, but if I send my son now uh, and he prophesies and tells them, you know, you'll see when the time is, get out of the city, that enough people will get out or stay out and there'll be a salvation in that. I don't know. Um, but it's just interesting thoughts when you, you read things like that. So it was a wild time. There were many insurgents and revolutionaries throughout Palestine. It was very active. And so you have to ask, whose side was Jesus on? Was he on the side of the Jews? where he came from. Those were his people, right? He was a Jewish man. Um, was he on the side of the Romans? Or was he neutral? Was he in between? Uh, who, if, if he leaned one way or the other, what way would he lean? Uh, you know, I would, you know, you might want to say, well, I would like to think that he would lean at least a little bit towards the Jews, right? Because that was his family, his friends, and everything else. Uh, and he probably disliked the Roman occupation. Um, you know, I, I read a lot and, and the people call it occupation, but honestly, was it an occupation? Rome, they ruled the world. It was their empire for long before Jesus came and for long after Jesus left. So uh, it's hard to see it, I think, uh, as an occupation, but I could see how people, um, you know, if someone occupied here, it would be an occupation. But would it really be an occupation if it was 500 years down the road and they were still here? I mean, life would have assimilated. Uh, and that's certainly how it was for many people there. Um, so the answer, I think, should not be surprising of whose side Jesus was on. Uh, because honestly, he could, be not, he could not be on a side and be uh, the Messiah that we read about in the scriptures. Um, but we're going to look at some of the reasons why uh, we see that he wasn't on a side. So the book of Mark is actually where we're going to um, take these from. And today we're going to be, uh, let me see. it's going to be Mark chapter 10. It'll be a few minutes before I get there, but let's turn over there so we're ready. So I read some interesting things about Mark, and actually uh, some of them come from a book which I don't have, but now you can bet that it'll be on my list to get. Um, so I, I, you know, let me say, I'm not an expert in these topics for sure. Um, I've only read a little bit about Josephus. Um, I have 
his two books, The Antiquities of the Wars of the Jews, in one volume. It's really kind of neat if you don't have it. It's broken up into chapters. You can find headings and go to certain topics that he talks about. Um, and some of this is in there, among many other things. Um, but much of what I'm going to talk about is going to be tailored down to studying about nonviolence in Scripture. So, uh, Mark, as told by a man named Howard Clark Key, book I don't have as of yet, he analyzes Mark's gospel. And he says it's not just a historical look at Jesus' time on earth, but is also, in quotation, on the spot instructions uh, in Mark's church or Mark's community where he teaches uh, and leads people uh, and gives a statement um, of his position and their position in the world around them. So you can picture Apostle Mark and uh, you know, he was active. He wrote a book. Um, I don't have the history of what Mark did afterwards, uh, but he was doing something. And he had people that he taught and talked with uh, and people that he wrote to. And to those people, what he wrote was something they could go back to as the world and things around them were developing. Uh, this man, Mr. Key, says that this community lived right up to the point of the sack of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple. So Mark was trying to get across the point, not just about this is what Jesus did while he was here. This is the picture of redemption as I understand it now. But this is how you need to think right now. After the fact, Jesus is gone. Uh, there's more and more uprisings and something is coming this is where we need to be. Um, and so uh, before we get further into what he says, I just I have a little in note uh, because it, it came up later as we're doing this. Um, and I want to talk a minute about crucifixions because crucifixions are very important uh, in the history of leading up to what happened to Israel. Um, I googled crucifixions and I got some information about where they came from. Uh, they actually came from the Babylonians uh, in the Syrians in some varying form or another, but it wasn't a widespread punishment. Uh, eventually it became widespread and the Romans really picked up on it uh, and as we will not say horrifyingly perfected it. Um, so my question was how many Jewish people were crucified around the time of the room. Uh, but if you look up things and look at some history things, if you Google it, uh, the Romans crucified ten thousands of people. Not just Jewish people, but people. Um, tens of thousands. M many of them probably innocent of anything. Just accused of things. Uh, and the crucifixions, uh, if you read about it, honestly, I'm not going to share them with you because some of them are pretty terrible. Uh, they're crucified in many ways. Uh, there wasn't just one form of crucifixion. Um, Jesus suffered one form of crucifixion. Uh, the carnage and the sack of Jerusalem and the suffering uh, that people went through and just the picture, if you read about it, is horrifying and it puts uh, revelation into great perspective to me. Um, you know, reading about the, the things that are in there, the visions that he had and the, how it was described. Uh, pretty amazing. But Titus, who was the general, was in charge of uh, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple, it said that he had 500 uh, Jews crucified every day leading up to, from the time they started uh, surrounding Jerusalem up to the time that Jerusalem was finally destroyed, uh, which is pretty, uh, pretty intense. Um, he, he tried to keep the crucifixions to the common form of crucifixion, but they also employed other armies besides Romans. Uh, apparently he had an army of Syrians who really hated the Jews, and they used all kinds of forms of crucifixion that he tried to stop, but he was not able to, so it was just let go. It was said that 
uh, a crucifixion, when you pulled your cross through the streets as Jesus did, it wasn't a cross. It was a beam that your hands were tied to or nailed to. Um, and when you got to the site, uh, you were lifted up and the beam was placed on what we would picture today as like scaffolding. It was said that around the time of the destruction of Jerusalem, there was so much scaffolding going all over the place. It was like a maze. It was hard to get in and out of, except for the army corridors. Um, and, and one writer said it would be difficult to look and see that there would be room for any other person hung on the cross. Uh, so reading these things, it, one thing that I started to wonder about, you know, we read in the scripture that uh, there were three people in Jesus' crucifixion, him and two uh, other men. And some people say, well, there was really six men or nine men or whatever. But I started thinking about it and I thought, well, that's all probably pretty pointless to think about because the, the whole point of having the two men there in the, in the story was to show us something um, about redemption. I think it's likely that Jesus, when he was crucified, was just on the daily execution list. And there were probably many other people being crucified at the same time. Uh, but Jesus was the focus. The other part of that, if you look at it that way, to me, is it puts the crucifixion in a little different perspective. Jesus identifies himself with, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have been crucified. Saying, I, you know, we read that crucifixion is a horrible way to die. It was the worst way to die. But he's also saying, I am dying all of you the same way you all died. Um, many of them innocent, uh, some guilty, uh, a horrific death. So it's no wonder that there were many people who were subversive and zealots because of the things that were going on and how the... <laughs> Fist was down on them, uh, and they're trying to get out. So how are they supposed to act in light of all these things? Um, and not just with crucifixions, but just in daily life, uh, having to pay taxes and, and all those things. Um, this man, Mr. Key, I think gives a pretty cool summation of four things, four options that they had. Uh, number one was to collaborate. Now, I'm not going to quote everything he said because it's, it's long, but my two sentences that breaks down his paragraph is, this is the position of the aristocratic elite of the Jews, Jewish leadership. Soak it for all it's worth. Ride the tide of the empire, ride on their coattails, turn in whoever we have to turn in to keep ourselves free so we can... Right? Um, you know, that was, that was one position that they took. The second one, uh, in quotations, he has, assume a more passive form of acquiescence. Um, this was a position of the Pharisees. We'll just acquiesce to them, not necessarily ride their coattails, but we have our own, uh, we have our own desires, our own goals, uh, which is, of course, to line our pockets and keep our power, but not just for themselves, but also for their communities. So they had a little more at stake besides their own personal family or themselves. They also did care for um, the communities that they oversaw. Uh, and so they just were passive towards it. Third one was to go to the desert and withdraw from society. That's what the Essenes did. They left society and went to the desert. Uh, because they did not want to um, deal with what was going on. And the Essenes, I always thought, were kind of peaceful, but they weren't. They were sword carriers, and they would do what they had to do uh, against Rome. And, of course, they were also attacked in the desert by Rome. The fourth was to be an insurrectionist, which was the most popular view of Jewish society. Uh, and, of course, this played out to see Rome as the obvious victor. As Mr. Eller says in his book, um, which I took some of this from, there was a fifth option which is laid out in the Gospel of Mark. And so we're going to turn to Mark chapter 10 and read verses 35 to 45. And we read that James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. 
And he said to them, What is it that you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the cup that I drink, or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, We are able. Then Jesus said to them, The cup that I drink you will drink, and with the baptism with which I am baptized you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and the great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. So the key verses that we want to see are are the last ones there, 45. Uh, So they ask him the question, can we be on your right and your left. They want to be um, in glory with him, and they want to be in power uh, with him. And, and of course, uh, they have their own uh, reasons behind this. Um, doesn't go too far into, but they, they want to be make sure that there's somebody uh, on one side or the other. Uh, the response that Jesus gives is interesting. I mean, there's the response um, about... Uh, what's about to happen to him, what's he about to go through. Um, but the, the other part of the response fits in with what we're talking, which is that the nations, the Gentiles, and in that we should read the Romans, the Greeks, the Persians, the Babylonians, uh, the Assyrians, Greeks, whoever, whatever uh, country is in charge, whatever empire is in charge, they have rulers, and their rulers take advantage of the people under them. Uh, and we need to read into that how they take advantage. It's oppression. That has been the rule of the day since man started ruling, right? Oppression. It was the rule of the day in Israel, unfortunately. Uh, and it was a clear, I think, sign of injustice. That's what he's talking about. And his point is, what is it like in my kingdom. I mean, I, I have to believe that when Jesus is telling him this, in his mind, he's got to be thinking, weren't you listening to me the past year or so? Kingdom is this. The kingdom is this. The kingdom is like that. And it's like being a servant, not being someone who lords it over you. Uh, and so I think Mark's community, if we take it like Mr. Key says, Uh, just received a very important, on-the-spot, as he said, instruction. We'll choose no side. No side. Uh, You will serve each other just as I have come to serve. Um, And as he's talking about a baptism and death, the way he was baptized, uh, it was in complete servitude to humankind. Um, We can read about that in Philippians chapter 2. I mean, it was uh, ultimate that he came and died as he did, as we just saw with crucifixions. Um, That is what side they're to be choosing. Uh, And he says, and you will bring that. Um, That is where they're supposed to be. So right here, I think Mark's community has, if they're ever approached, if they're ever uh, inclined to say, I like that guy, he's fiery, I'm joining his side. And then their sister or their brother says, no, I'm going to the other one. And then eventually they end up fighting each other because that's exactly what happened. Uh, No, you are part of something. And that something means servitude. If you want to be somebody, then you need to be nobody. And the point of being nobody isn't so you can be somebody. It's just a point of fact. Um, That's what servitude does. If we turn over to chapter 14, 
And we read verses 60 and 62. So Jesus here is before the council, and he's being asked many questions uh, and um, accusations against him. In verse 60, it says, Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Have you no answer? What is it that they testify against you? But he was silent and did not answer. And then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? Jesus said, I am, and you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. So, really interesting here, the perspective, when you understand that in Jesus' time there were other people claiming to be the Messiah, but Jesus claimed to be a different kind of Messiah than the other ones. He was the Son of God. When they ask, are you the Messiah, the Blessed One, Jesus finally answers, yes, I am the Messiah of God, of God, from his kingdom. I am the king of his kingdom, not a Messiah to free you from, not the Messiah down the road that you all love and the other one that you hate. I'm not choosing this side or that side. He's having accusations thrown at him from people who don't even agree with each other. They're just throwing it out there so they can get rid of him. Uh, and through all these, he sits in silence um, because the power struggles of the Jews not matter to Jesus at all. Uh, so again, on the spot instructions for the people in Mark's community Struggles around you that the Jews have with each other and with Rome don't matter to belong to the side of Jesus. Um, there is no side. If Jesus agreed with one and disagreed with the other, then he would have been on the side of one and not on the other. Uh, and so it didn't matter. Uh, and he is saying, this is who I belong to, and here I come soon. Um, get ready, because it was big when he came. Uh, if we turn over to chapter 15 and read verses 2 through 5, uh, it says, Pilate asked him, now we have the same thing, right? He was with the Sanhedrin, uh, and they barraged him with questions. He answered one, uh, and so they take him finally to the Roman uh, governor in charge, of Palestine because they want to know um, can they have him crucified. Pilate asked him, are you the king of the Jews? He answered him, you say so. Then the chief priest accused him of many things. Pilate asked him again, have you no answer? See how many charges they bring against you. But Jesus made no further reply so that Pilate was amazed. He had no defense. Uh, if you, uh, we're not going to turn there, but if you go to Luke chapter 23 and read of the same exchange in verse 2, it tells of some of the things that he was uh, being accused of. And it says, they began to accuse him, saying, we found this man perverting our nation. How do they stand in front of Pilate and talk about our nation? Because they don't have a nation, right? Uh, you know, it would be interesting to have a word for word or thought for thought of what went on in everybody's minds, uh, what Pilate was thinking at that moment. But it, then it says, forbidding us to pay taxes to the emperor and saying that he himself is the Messiah, a king. So the Messiah, a king, as spoken of in scripture, uh, even though there's also many other people claiming to be messiahs who were going to free them, their nation from Rome, at the same time they're accusing him of forbidding us to pay taxes, which obviously that is not what he did. Um, but they're looking for a reason, of course, uh, to have him killed. The crowd we know calls for the release of another man, as spurred on by the, uh, the Sanhedrin, the Pharisees. His name is uh, Barabbas. Barabbas, uh, in the scripture sometimes we read that he was a murderer. 
Um, and, you know, I, growing up, I always thought he was like uh, the guy I see on the news, finally put behind bars. Um, it turns out that this man was a hero to many people in the Jewish community because he was an insurrectionist. His murdering and his looting and everything else, uh, it might have been against some Jews who opposed him or his side, but it mainly it was against the Romans. Um, so, you know, like today when uh, some servicemen are captured by another country and the other country says, we'll let him go if you release our guy. That's what this was. Our guy who is, uh, you're going to release him and probably going to wish you hadn't and gobble him up again soon. But that's what they cry for. Uh, and again, of course, Mark tells his community there's no answer. You don't choose a side. They will call for your death. You will probably be persecuted, even by your own people. But you don't choose a side. And the kingdom of God has nothing to do with the powers of the world. Uh, nothing. And so that is what I want to lead into, uh, the, what Jesus has to say about paying taxes, why he says what he says. Um, and, you know, I call this studies in nonviolence because truly Jesus was on the side of not fighting, of not violence. He was on the side of redemption and pull out. Um, Mark's community that he was in uh, would be, uh, as that man called it, a church. They would be a called out group. Part of the ecclesia, they separate from the world. So, regardless of what was going on around them, I reclaim my dollar. Uh, it might buy me a cup of coffee someday, maybe. Most coffee is more than a dollar. But he was, the point being that you're on one side, and what's going on around you should not involve you. Doesn't matter. Focus on one thing, uh, the cross of Christ, uh, and you will go the right way, even though it might mean that uh, physically it could be the wrong way for you. Uh, and so the next time, um, I'm not sure if it'll be next week or, or not, uh, but the next time we'll, talk, we'll get into the actual um, paying of taxes and what Jesus has to say. Have uh, a quarter till. Um, so we're going to have a few minutes. So folks at home, go freshen up your coffee, grab something to eat. Um, before we get started at 11, we'll see you back.